there's still the mantra that we use today, the first bit of money that an artist will make in the music industry is from publishing. Mm. So you're probably not going to get paid for your first show. You go and write a song and you play it live to get validation that people like it. And you're going to get a six quid for that gig. Mm. So it's the, literally the first bit of money that you will generate is publishing and, and, and it, people still don't understand it to this day. Welcome to Your Music Industry. My name is Daniel Fisher-Jones and it's my purpose and mission to help you go full-time in music. So what happens when you start an organisation in university? Maybe in the case of Centric Music, it goes on to change the landscape of the music industry and bring some real change. Centric Music now has over 70 employees in a whole range of international offices, including New York, LA, Hamburg, and of course, Liverpool. Hence I'm wearing my university hoodie today, because this project started at a university, kind of like what Liverpool Audio and your music industry has for me. On today's show, we have CEO Chris Meehan talking about the centric music journey, some of the lessons he's learned along the way on music entrepreneurship, and some real nuggets on the world of decision making and focus. Before we get to the episode, I'd just like to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Liverpool Audio Network with the brand new Studio Art Collection. As you'll see on screen, these are slick, modern, minimalist posters inspired by some of the most iconic hardware we know and love in music production. So without further ado, let's jump straight into the conversation with Chris Meehan on the world of centric music, music entrepreneurship and making decisions. Let's go. So yeah, welcome Chris to Your Music Industry. Thanks for sitting down today in Centric HQ in Liverpool. You're very welcome. How are, how are things been lately? Because it's been a little while since we've been able to fit this in. You've been international, so to speak. Yeah, no, it's been busy. We've, um, we, we've been doing lots of stuff abroad and lots of new people joining the business. So it's been getting out and seeing everyone and making sure everyone knows what it is that we do and all the music's in the right place to, to, to go out and, uh, and get represented. Mm. Do, do you find it integral to keep kind of everyone on the same page of the vision of the, the why of the company? Yeah, um, and I think the only way you can do that is face to face. Like Zoom and things are great, but if you really want to go and get stuck in, um, you know, you, you can't see the culture of something over a conference call. So it's important <laughs> to make sure that we're kind of out and working with everyone that's working with the company and representing it in the way that we we want it represented. Really, so face to face is the only way of doing that. Well, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Centric has a rather, I say, humble beginning from the start of Lipper. Would you kind of walk me through your early years of the music industry, so to speak, and the beginning days of Centric? Yeah, so um, I, I was always in bands and stuff in school, so I did the whole play Robbie Williams in a in a shit pub in <laughs> Warrington on a Saturday night for 40 quid or whatever, and then... Um, when it came to looking at university, I kind of always liked media and business and music and discovered Lippo, which kind of wasn't on the tongue of any careers advisors. Mm. Um, but, you know, it was kind of perfect. It was a music management degree, so it's kind of business, law, contract, marketing, um, but all focused around music. And there was theatre and, and wider arts and stuff, but really my focus was on music. So when we went to Lippo, the great thing about it at the time and probably still now was that you can go and get out your system all the things that you don't want to do <laughs> so I was a manager for a bit um, we used to promote nights um, so we used to do like Zanzibar and Magna and used to put bands on that were around so kind of got the promoting thing out of the way and then um, third year is you have to do a work placement um, so the work placement that I was going to do was a music management work placement but mm. that fell through like a week before so um there's Steve who was in the O2 Academy at the time that I could have gone and worked there and done my placement or or look at doing something else. So we managed to convince Dave Pitch, who was the lecturer at the time, to let us set um, set our business up and went, went off not knowing what it was going to be, but decided to look at publishing. Mm, that's interesting. So to start, so that that's interesting because I've done that myself with me uni degree is gone for like the self-employed route of starting something of your own kind of doing to take that step into testing an idea out and stepping into publishing did you know exactly 
what you were going to do or was it like I'm just going to make something and publish and see what happens no we had no idea so at the start um, Phil Cooper who was um, a colleague on the on, on, on the course at uni um, he decided to set his own company up um, and he did um, a thing called Creative Cultures which was like it was like e flyering almost mm. um, the kind of thing looking back and probably built Bitly but didn't call it Bitly and used to charge Ministry of Sound money <laughs> to flyer on forums before Facebook yeah. so that was kind of like you know talking to Phil about the predicament that I was in and then we said, well, let's go and look at publishing because no one knows what it is. And we've been three years into university. No one really knows what it is. Um, and we were in the city. And I think um, Tony Wilson said something along the lines of, um, you know, he has a load of publishers, but no one knows what they fucking do, but go to the bar because they're all minted. <laughs> so we were like, there must be something yeah. in this. Um, and then from then, we kind of just went away and thought, well, let's just go and find out exactly what it is. Um, and then Andy, who's another co-founder of the business, um, he had a, a lot of office space at the time. He did a technology business that went a little bit wrong. So he had software developers and office space. So we went in and started digging around what publishing was. And it was frightening really when I started off with friends who were in publishing deals and asked them what they did and what the deals were and stuff. And it just all looked a little bit mad and everyone was unhappy and no one really knew what it was. Mm. So that's kind of when we thought, well, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit of getting in after a night out of Hannah's and buying like I bought unsigned mp3.com and stuff I was always thinking maybe there's something with tech um, you know the publishing things just seemed really interesting because there was all of this money being collected whether you knew what it was or not and mm. there was no real interest in helping people interface with it so the money was still there it was just going to the wrong people because the people that it should go to weren't engaging mm. and and it wasn't like a conspiracy I think it's just because it was complicated yeah wow. and that's where the idea for Centric came I mean the very first business plan that we did was radio shows and festivals and all sorts of stuff but actually you know you, you do that to fluff it out to make it sound good but the core principle of helping people access publishing income is, is what we do today mm. so has has that vision and has that kind of mission statement ever changed subtly or has it always just been like the foundation, the cornerstone of Centric? It's the foundation, really. I mean, mm. you know, the, the, we, we started by, we literally got a whiteboard up and wrote down the terms that one of my friends had on a publishing agreement and did the opposite. <laughs> so it was like, you know, 28 years ownership of the copyright. So we thought, well, we'd do 28 days because more people <laughs> will get involved. And it was like ridiculous split. So we were like, well, let's change that the other way around. And the whole point of it really was about accessibility for people to get them into the ecosystem so that any bit of money they get is going to go back to them. And we kind of always, there's still the mantra that we use today, the first bit of money that an artist will make in the music industry is from publishing. Mm. So you're probably not going to get paid for your first show, write a song and you play it live to get validation that people like it. And you're going to get a six quid for that gig. Mm. So it's the, literally the first bit of money that you will generate is publishing and, and, and it's, people still don't understand it to this day. So it's really important that we spend a lot of time and effort and money on educating um, songwriters, making sure that we're around, doing songwriter accelerator programs, helping them meander the world of funding in the early stages, you know, that sort of stuff we still do. Mm. That, 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 that's really interesting. As myself and Kia now, like within Liverpool Audio Network, we have so many producers who have this unknown kind of thing of the industry and un uh, totally unknown to publishing. And as you said, it's like the initial the initial money, so it's the steps in getting them set up to do that. So looking at the first few years of Centric as a business, as you growing as, say, an entrepreneur from being a manager and a student, how was that received? Was it a struggle? Was was the PRS receptive? How, how was that in the early years? Well, no, I've, I've listened to Mark's <laughs> yeah. podcast that you did with him, and he was obviously in PRS at the time. So I wouldn't say, I think it was, it was suspicion was mm. probably within the, the um, you know, within the, the kind of publishing community at first. And, you know, like you guys probably don't, I didn't care about anything because this was something that I wanted to do. So when you, you know, the, the benefit of setting something up when you're 20 is that you've got nothing to lose. You know, you only pay your student loan back if you make money, so yeah. you don't make any, nothing's going to, you know, it's the best time, you've not got a wife, you've not got kids, you've not got a mortgage. So for me, it was just very determined that we were going to make this work and it was just about doing it in baby steps and proving 
that it was valuable. Mm. Um, and that's when Simon came on board um, in kind of year one, and we had um, friends that were working at major record labels, so they had a company car, and they were going scouting in Newcastle or whatever, so Simon used to hop in the car, go to see the producers, get the best bands in Newcastle or Leeds or Sheffield signed up, and then nine months later we'd pay him some money, and then you just saw that city kind of go boom, you know, it was, <laughs> people were like, this is free money. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's great. So. You mentioned then how, like, when you're 20, uh, you've got basically no risk, you're just going at it. As much as that is true, how did, like, you fund eating? How did you fund living? Did you pay yourself a wage in the early years, or did you have a part-time job to support yourself? Well, I was still in uni, so I had, like, at uni, I had three jobs. Um, So I was kind of, I was doing all the promoting stuff. I worked at a kitchen at the weekends all weekend and I used to work at a comedy club on a Friday night. So I kind of kept that up until this kind of had a little bit of legs. And then um, what really popped it up was it was a really nice time because like I said, Phil had done creative cultures. We'd done centric and we were all in the same office. So we kind of funded ourselves being paid by doing different things so I didn't take any money out of Centric for the first few years um, but I was doing other stuff so we built another company alongside it mm. um, so the one that Phil founded um, I was working and we grew that team we did really really well um, for five six years um, so that kind of propped up that paid for Centric almost but then the ecosystem in Liverpool at the time was very different so um you know, we got a grant, so we, we came up with the idea in September 2005, incorporated the business in February 2006, and we got a grant in April um, from the Merseyside Music Development Agency at the time, um, which was great because it allowed us to start building our platform. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we took some investment on early, uh, early doors um, from Andy, who was one of the founders. Um, you know, he had the technology resource there, so we were kind of like nicely incubated, so kind of nothing you know we weren't really waiting for anything we just got on with it mm. so it was like great timing as well as the great perfect opportunity of having the right people and the right team at the right time yeah yeah and then you know we've probably raised every single bit of money that you could possibly think of <laughs> since then um but you know for the first few years we kind of just wanted to prove that we could get a band signed up to a really friendly deal that they really enjoyed the experience and that we collected money for them mm. and that's what we did and then I kind of like you go all the way around the board pass go and then collect a bit more investment along the way because you've proved the thing in the first place that you can kind of move forward with mm. in those early years did you have any particular mentors or particular people other than the partners in the business who helped you or maybe any particular resources as coming from let's say not so much an entrepreneurial background to jump straight in and be raising capital to be doing everything as a business does. Was there any particular things that helped you in your growth? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, well, personally, I think, you know, working with Andy was, was great um, because he'd been through and done all of that. So kind of, you know, b- before we even opened the doors, we had a term sheet for investment, like for £100,000 off a venture capital company um, and went, you know, I went through that experience before we went through the experience of starting the business. Mm. Um, and I don't know, I just found it quite enjoyable, but also quite easy. To If you've got a good idea, then, you know, it's like if you've got a good song, yeah. it's a good song. Yeah. If you've got a good idea, it's exactly the same and people listen. So, um, no, I, you know, and Andy was great. And then wider in the industry, um, you know, there's people who really liked what we were doing. Um, you know, people like Mark, who you're working with now, and uh, and other people around that you kind of lean on. And um, but it, it was like it was a new idea, and it was fair, and it gave money to people that didn't know it existed. So it kind of all felt all straightforward. Mm. And there's certainly value there for the clients, for the songwriters, because they get money. <laughs> and then because like the, the biggest thing we see here within is people want to go full time, but they don't know how to make money. So if people got access to more money, the value's there for them, isn't it? And well, well that's the thing you can generate. You know, we've seen so many things come and go, and we've we've, you know, we've launched stuff that doesn't hasn't worked. Um, but I always think that like instead of trying to change the world, just fit into the world that exists and make sure that there's value in what you're doing. So all of the music startups at the time were going, the biggest problem in the music industry is that people can't listen to whatever they want on the devices. And you kind of think, well, you, you, you're creating a problem to solve 
because people can access music, you know, whether mm. they rob it or whether at the time, you know, it's not as much anymore. Um, it's like just fit into something and find a problem with something that already exists and fix that and then you'll be all right. And I think that every time you start a business, I think you need to think about, well, where do I fit in the ecosystem and where am I going to get paid from? And mm. then it's just a matter of when it happens rather than if it will ever happen. Mm. So like kind of a, a realist perspective saying like, this is the industry, this is how it's going to work instead of trying to make a whole new industry. Yeah, yeah. and that's what you kind of, you know, when, when you know, on the other foot now, if you're kind of mentoring people that are doing startups and they'll come to it's always think about where you're going to make money because if you, if you don't know where you're going to make money, then it's probably not going to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think people just dwell too much on the. I think if everything is right and everything's aligned, you'll find it easy to go. For, it won't be a, a thing you think about going from going full time because mm. you'll just do it. Ah, okay. Andy. Again, being twenty, it might <laughs> yeah. be very different now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I think it's still obviously there's different the landscape has changed within terms of grants and everything, but the structure is very similar from my understanding to back when you were 20. Um, but there's more money out there now than there was then. Um, it's just that it's a little bit more filtered. So like, you know, it's not grant, uh, but you know, grants aren't easy to get either. Mm. It's the same principle. You have to, you know, if, you, if you're going to get a grant, you'll probably be able to do something with a bank and you'll definitely be able to do something with a venture capital company mm. because it's the path to money is the most important thing and making sure that you can demonstrate that these are the things that need to happen for this to happen and I can go and do it. And there's the amount of money that's washed with the Northern Powerhouse Fund and things like that now. It's 2012, it was the Northwest Fund, which, you know, funded a lot of businesses that are around here. Mm. Um, you know, that access is there if it's a good idea. Mm. Great, great, yeah. I think we'll have to check that out again because <laughs> it, it, it is something we we do kind of struggle with is coming from not so much an entrepreneurial background we're all we all originally started as music producers kind of leaping into this entrepreneurial world of trying to raise money or trying to work on a business model is as fun it is as stressful as times have you had a fair share of stress would you say in the the, the journey of centric um yeah oh yeah <laughs> I mean, you know, looking back now, yeah, there's been lots of stressful times. But um, the first, the first thing that we wrote was 80, 20, 28 days. So our business model hasn't really changed. Mm. That's a small part of our business now. It's maybe 10, 12 percent of our business, but that same thing is the foundation. And then changing either way up or down, longer or shorter or advances or whatever it's all kind of just an iteration of the thing that we started off with mm. um, so we've not really changed we, the, we looked at the, at the very very beginning of having tiers where people would pay like a membership or whatever um, and you scrap that and you know I think that's where we looked at how can we get the most amount of people to benefit from what we're trying to build and it was to make it accessible and make it fair mm. so you know we've never really changed that much <laughs> which is it's bizarre, you know, over, yeah, yeah. over, what, 13 years now? That is crazy, especially with the industry changing as well in, in those 13 years. It's, 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 it's mind-blowing. So you mentioned there how that's 12%, 10 to 12% of Centric's kind of revenue. What are the other revenue streams and what would you say is the biggest, if you can share that? Well, it's all publishing. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's actually not. It's majority publishing administration or publishing revenues. Um and where we kind of ended up, so we built this thing to suit artists. So when we had the 28 day deal, and then we were like, hang on a minute, why is it taking us so long to get money from Germany? You know, why has this band not been paid for that gig that happened or that radio stream or whatever? And then we kind of were looking at that, and then we, we went to mid -M and we did the industry thing and we found everyone uses sub-publishers and we thought, well, what does that mean and what's that look like? And, you know, we probably weren't that attractive. So some publishers, we didn't have a big catalogue, so mm. it wasn't a great deal for them. Um, but we kind of just decided that we want everything to be in our own hands, so that if an artist rings us up and says, what's happening in Germany? I don't have to bring a partner in Germany. I just know because we're doing the work. So we joined all the collection societies we could, and we went through iterations and iterations. We're still joining more. There's not that many left that we've got to join. Um, and because we did that for bands on a 28-day service, which some people might have thought was mad and overkill, um, we became very attractive to other people. Um, so we power lots of other publishing businesses. Mm. Um, 
and it's that kind of collection network that they want access to, but also then we do synchronization and we've moved into neighboring rights, which is the performer and sound recording owner right that's similar to publishing um so as we kind of grow we're just looking at how can we be the best friend of all the people that we work with and how can we make sure that we can do a better job at a lower cost than they'd be able to do it themselves mm. and that's where our kind of power in other people whether it be distributors or record labels or other publishers or management companies that's mm. where the rest of it is and a lot of that focus is on helping people and that's I can guess one of the many reasons why Centric is a success and still here today because it, it is that it's, it's helping people in their journeys and people with music it might be a hobby but it's their passion it's what they live for so to help them in that journey is a, like a, a dream isn't it? Well the great, the great thing for us as well is that um, you know we looked at well we can't work with every artist in the world so you kind of look at, okay, well, you know, there's 28 days as well. We were kind of like, well, you know, if people leave, you know, we've had lots of bands that have gone on to the very, very successful things, have, have been with us for two, three years, and then have gone, oh, we're going to move on to this other publishing company because they've offered us some money, or this guy's going to change our lives, or whatever it is. And we looked and we were like, well, why are people, even if we build the best collection network that we think that we could build, mm. why are people moving to somewhere else? And you realise it's relationships, it's creative relationship and stuff. So we kind of looked at it and thought, well, we should really be powering these other people because it's great if you've got a band that's making a certain amount of money and then they move somewhere else. But if somewhere else has got less infrastructure than where they are, then they're not going to be better off yeah, yeah. so we were like we need to go and power all these other people so that the bands have got the same level of collection but also so that we can work with other people to develop and help in the journey of developing something and it might be you know our role in certain situations might be we just collect as much money as we possibly can and pay it through and that's it it might be that we help co-write we help sync we help license we help develop we help a and but it's kind of we just fit into every situation as the needs of the person that we're working with or the organisation is and, and off we go mm. and um, you know I think that's been great and it's great that we you know it's just we can work with more people we never thought when we set the business up that we were working like in a business to business way we thought it'd always be direct with the artist but it's, it's much better yeah, yeah and in that journey as well like you t the team from I remember when I first learned about Centric in college to today the team just keeps growing and growing and growing. Do you think there's going to be a point where the scale and will slow down or oh, is it just going to be a never-ending <laughs> snowball effect? I don't know. I suppose I create problems with people in here because I kind of disappear for a little bit and come back with another thing because I don't know do this. Um, but no, I mean, I don't think our ambition is to slow down. Mm. Um, and I think it was really important is that we don't slow down if we're taking on more copyrights and more clients. We don't want to have you know, the same amount of people dealing with 10 times the volume of, of, of people that we work with. So we're scaling it in line with the business. It's not kind of, and it, it needs it. Because mm -hmm. I think that, you know, we've invested millions of pounds in software. Um, and software is fantastic because it allows us to do our job more efficiently. It allows us to give a little bit of a benefit to someone else in what they can view. But there's nothing more powerful than picking the phone up or going and seeing someone. And I think that's, you know, it's technology to make us better at our job, but we still want to make sure that we've got that personal relationship with people that we work with. Mm. So talk about clients behind us. We've got some rather nice kind of awards. You've yeah. got one dance from Drake and you've got a bit of Shakira. Yeah. Could you talk us through how centric of being involved with that? Is that part of kind of using that infrastructure and investing into the bigger artists to kind of create those deals or? Uh, well, not necessarily. I mean, it's a nice step. So we've got tons, well, not to blow <laughs> but there's a, you know, there's a lot of big songs. I suppose what people don't understand about Centric is that it's, whilst we do our, we started with our common, everybody get a publishing or whatever, it's naturally led to being involved in, in massive records, um, which is great. And, you know, with one dance and Drake, that was um, Peter who joined. Um, the, the, there's some guys that ended up getting sampled, um, and that was uh, we, we picked up the guys that were sampled on it, which was fantastic for them. It's changed their careers. Um, and then bizarrely, the uh, Shakira one is from someone that signed up. Mm -hmm. a, a guy called John Conte signed up on the internet because. Uh, 
business manager in Atlanta said you need to go and use these guys and really? he, he writes phenomenal songs with phenomenal people and um, he's a very very good guy uh, so yeah there's um you know we've got we've got tons of other stuff with companies that we've bought or um we partnered with where they've just got huge huge songs that you know we never thought we'd end up working with but the great thing is that we've got a really hungry sync team that you know, giving big old famous songs to really hungry sync people is is a, is, is a great thing. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to talk about sync for a moment because for something I find electronic, like dance music producers, electronic DJs and kind of that area as a whole, they see their music as made for the dance floor and then music for film and TV is like made by composers. There is that middle ground, isn't it, where, say for like Love Island, Centrix place songs on Love Island, where they can be from like a dance music origin. Yeah. Have you got any kind of advice for those people in terms of sync deals? Is it as simple as make the tracks and pitch them to the Centrix pitch team, uh, sync team, or? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the sync world is, um, I don't know, there's no formula to it, and then I've seen lots of companies that have come around trying to put a formula or whatever, and it's just bizarre. It's the worst thing in the world to forecast. It's the worst thing to manage expectation on with other people, because, you know, you might have a song that is really no good for sync that will get synced, and you might have a song that's perfect for sync that will never get used. Mm. Um, so there's like a punk band from Brooklyn I think it is called Cerebral Ballsy and it's like really I remember seeing them at Liverpool Music Week when it was behind here in the yeah. uh, in what's the school now and um, it was just chaos and you just think it's great live you know they're all fighting in the crowd and everything and it's all kicking off you think oh, that'll never be used but then Crabby sponsored the Grand National and there were some crazy crazy uh, like trailer for it um, and they used that song in it and you thought well that's mad you know, it might never get synced again but it was just right for that and um, I suppose you know people who I think if you write music for sync and it's on top you can see straight through it mm. I think that um, you know where electronic music is kind of difficult is that it is for dance floor and dance floor isn't what goes on TV. So unless you've kind of got a specific seed in the TV show or whatever, yeah. um, you know, it might not lend itself because sync is really about hooks and relatable lyrics and stuff like that. You know, if you take like, it's the most wonderful time of the year, you know, it's a perfect Christmas yeah, yeah. song for a Christmas advert. Um, but if you take some kind of deep tech house remix, it's just not got the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? But, um, you know, we've do, I suppose when it works, you know, we've we've done really well with with um, you know, we've done some Mercedes Benz syncs, um, with electronic music. We did the Ronnie Size and Rag and Bone Man, um, s summer of um, sport on Sky mm. trailer, which is really good. So there's you know, there's definitely a world for it, but I just don't think that it, it's it's not a match made in heaven. You know yeah. what I mean? It, it's just it's always the more commercial stuff that will end up getting used. You know, if you listen to Love Island and stuff like that, it is all your cigala and the kind of you know commercial pop dance stuff. Mm. Um, but you know, maybe maybe it'll change. Maybe maybe more people will want to use it in the future. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. The only thing we can do is make sure that the music goes in front of the right people, and if they want it, then they'll use it. Mm. So, do you think for producers or composers and songwriters in electronic music to, to build the relationships with the sync team here or the sync team at the publishing as that personal connection and the person on the team knowing their sound would that help them would you say more than anything yeah 100 percent. and then you know what we do with a lot of people that we work with is send them stuff that we get requested so we've got a playlist and we said look this is what we're being asked for you know in america at the moment like trap is really Everyone wants a bit of trap, and you know the jo the definitions within the genre are always quite strange because EDM in America is not what EDM is yeah. here. So you know we, the relationship definitely helps in understanding what, what it is that people want. Definitely helps in understanding what it is that people are looking for. Definitely helps. Mm. We do like a little composer series where um, we'll kind of handpick some people and say Go make some music around this you know yeah, yeah. And, um, and that gets used obviously more more often than not okay but um you know it it's di it's just a difficult world i mean you might have the greatest pop song sang you know in the wispy female singer song right john lewis style and it just won't get used mm. to it there's no rhyme or reason to it interesting that really interesting so i'd love for to talk about kind of your lifestyle as say an entrepreneur as a ceo as 
there's a lot of people now because entrepreneurial kind of spirits become not quite commercialized but it's become a big part of culture loads of people would like to probably know what a ceo ceo does day to day i probably guess it's not as um <laughs> glorious as it sounds but i still change th- light bulbs <laughs> i still go to costco and buy toilet that will <laughs> I've, I've, I've heard about your trips to costco <laughs> what what do you do day to day chris as a ceo well i suppose you know what we're looking to do is grow um so we try to create an environment where we can get really good people to work together and make a real difference in what they're doing for people. And that kind of keeps everything stable. And then the things that we go and work on are the things that are going to make the difference. So it might be that we really want to have a great sync team in North America, so we need to go build that. Mm. And we might really want to be doing stuff in Asia that's really interesting or whatever it is. Um, I think that you know my job is to make sure that we don't stand still and that we keep on going and that everyone's got all the resources that they need to be able to do the job to the best of their ability. Mm. And that's it in a nutshell. Um, I don't know if that means anything. But <laughs> yeah, I, I'm still cool, you know, I, st- I don't know. It still doesn't really feel like work when you come. Um, it doesn't, well, it does when you've been away from it, when you come back and you're like, well, okay, this is a, it's got a bit out of hand here. <laughs> this is quite a lot of people. But um, no, just making sure that everyone cracks on is the, is the thing that we do and make sure that we can lead everyone with the best example mm. do, you th- do you think over the past say five to ten years there's anything you've got better at saying no to oh, 100% at what, what, what are those well you kind of say I don't know when we first started the business you think well for the first five years we probably thought about you know everything <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah I, I, what can we do to make money and then the next five years they could have, oh what you know we need, we need to go and sell this thing to someone else and then you kind of settle down after 10 years and you go actually let's just crack on so and crack on with a core set of kind of this is what we're going to do so you know we used to experiment with loads of stuff and we've done like live shows we've done a brand division we've done um, master stuff like we've done all sorts of stuff and we kind of stripped it back and thought actually let's just stick to the things that we do really well which is developing really good technology powering publishing or whatever level that might be mm. and doing really good creative work and if it doesn't fit into them three swim lanes then we're not doing it anymore unless it's like the best idea in the world ever yeah. um, so we still do get a little bit distracted sometimes because you're always kind of looking for opportunity and you go oh I could do that but we have to write it in because mm. I recently read did you start like an internal not ad agency but an internal kind of ad structure for connecting artists to brands is that we did think? yeah uh, we did that with Alistair Goldsmith who's a music manager who lives locally and Craig Thompson who used to be at Sound City and uh yeah, we started doing, we thought well, it would be great because brands want access to artists and artists want access to brands. And we set up a brand division where we were going and pitching to people around campaigns that they could do with artists. And then we ended up making a Thai food tea advert with Nigella Lawson. And we ended up doing some crazy thing for Fly being a lingus with the pool airport. We took artists and Darren Farley and people out to Amsterdam. And we thought this isn't really adding any value to a songwriter's life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just got massively out of hand in terms of where you end up going and like looking for opportunity. So we kind of, um, you know, we looked at, we, we did some work with, um, with, with some consultants on is there a space for us in brands? And we kind of thought, you know what, other people do that for a living and they're better at it. So let's work with them. Um, and, you know, sync and brand work is becoming more and more closely linked. So, you know, what we found actually out of all of that experimenting is that if we're doing a sync for someone with a brand, then maybe that artist should be tweeting about the brand and maybe the artist should feature in the advert. And that's kind of where we've seen it wrap up and that's creating value for songwriters, which is the most important thing that yeah. we do. Um, so, you know, we're kind of happy. We're, we're, it was a weird journey <laughs> to get to where we've ended up, but um, it was good fun. Do you think learning from those opportunities where you've pursued it and changed priorities or decided to f- refocus on a certain thing, is there anything you've learned in, in regards to making decisions or any kind of philosophy on how to stick to your focus and vision? Well, you know, I'm the worst and like my wife would definitely be testament to that, just getting distracted with stuff, but that can do that on my own time. But in work, I think, you know, the, you need to just make decisions quickly and as, and as soon as you think it's not right or it's not working, you just pull it 
because if you let it drag on and drag on, it's not first of anyone that's working in it. And it's just a waste of time, really. You could put your energy into something that is working. Um, so seeing something not being quite right and doing something about it very quickly is definitely um, definitely what I'd take away yeah. from experience of not doing that in the past. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if you, you could have just answered this question, but if you could go back to and tell yourself, your former self, one piece of advice when you're starting Centric, whether a business avenue whether a revenue stream whether a philosophy whether a gym workout what would that one piece of advice be focus focus mm. focus as in like a tunnel vision on one specific Just thing stick to stuff that is good and that is what you're supposed to be doing and don't spend time or waste time getting excited about other things i think you know when all of the other stuff that we've got it done we focus on three things which are bizarrely the same three things that we started with mm. so you look at all of that stuff where opportunistically it might have looked like a good idea at the time but if you fast forward we're not doing anything in any of those things that we wasted time looking at we're doing the three things that we were supposed to do and I think that's kind of you know, not saying that you can't branch out or anything like that you know we branched out with technology you know we built our own and stuff like that but um you just spend so much time looking at these things and, 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 you know, getting carried away with, oh, that could be amazing and stuff like that. And I think the focus is definitely the key. Mm. And there's that classic Steve Jobs quote, isn't it? It's like by saying no to more things, you can focus and make one thing the best. Ever. Yeah. And that's apples. Well, <laughs> little... <laughs> entrepreneurially, you know, you kind of do say yes to everything when you early doors because you don't want to miss out. Mm. Well, actually now, you know, we, when we say no, it's not because... It's not because, well, if we say no, it's because it's just, it's not going to work out. You know, we've done it that much that we know that we shouldn't waste our time on, you know, anyone's time, including someone that might want us to do something. You know, if it's just not going to work out, it's not going to work out. And it just saves the pain of, of going through a process where it's you know, you're wasting time, really. So unfortunately, we're coming to an end to the podcast, but we always end on a question looking forward to the next five years of the music industry. So if there's something you could change, whether locally to Liverpool, nationally or internationally and globally, what one change would you like to see within the music industry or within publishing? Um, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I mean, locally in Liverpool, I'd like to see a lot more accessibility to things that are happening and a bit more community. Like Liverpool's got a bizarrely um, massive amount of employment in the sector, but no one really knows about it. Mm. And I'd like to see Liverpool become like, you know, a place where people will move to to work in the industry, like Berlin has become, um, you know, and it's very, very similar, I think, in its ethos and the space and the people. And then in publishing, I think it's really interesting um, because there's so much money flying around because people have realised that streaming's boomed and, you know, I don't know what's going to be left Like, because people were, there was companies that we used to you know, compete with but we were in the same space as and you just see them getting picked off the shelf every day so I don't know, I think all the consolidation that's happening, I think you're going to start seeing some really good, interesting, creative-led publishing companies popping up that, um, you know, might, might, might change the world. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks very a lot welcome. for sitting down. I understand you're very busy, so thank you very much for sitting very down and being a part. Thanks, Chris. Nice one. Thank you.